Welcome, I had hoped some of you would be interested in this topic, cultural diversity and what is a woman. My name's Marty Braden and before I begin sharing this topic, I want to explain what my channel is about for those of you who are watching one of my videos for the very first time. That way you'll understand it more fully because you'll know the why behind my videos. First of all, let me make the point that I'm not a professional YouTuber, that is for sure. But I'm sure you already know that. <laughs> I don't have a staff of professional producers working behind the scenes producing fancy high techy videos for me. Like many YouTubers, you watch and are, uh, most of them are very professional. But I think you'll still enjoy my content because it's quite informative and especially if you don't know that much about the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, which is more commonly known as the Mormons. As a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, I recently published a book I titled An Atheist Delusion, and that's where I get all of my topics for my videos. My arguments are from my Latter-day Saint perspective on Richard Dawkins' book, The God Delusion. Richard, as you know, is a world-renowned atheist who was an evolutionary biologist. Richard absolutely dislikes religion. In his introduction to his book, he said, quote, the purpose for writing The God Delusion was to make atheists out of all his readers. <laughs> anyway, after I published An Atheist Delusion, I decided to set up this channel so I could record and post short videos of me reviewing every single anti-God argument Dawkins put forth in his book. And so far, I've posted 116 videos on my channel. The video you're watching now is part 117. In that series. So with that said, I'm going to pick it up where I left off last time. I was ready to begin reviewing the second subtitle of chapter 9, which is In Defense of Children. So let's jump right to there. For this subtitle, Richard summarizes his case for defending children from their adult overseers, their parents, religious leaders, political leaders, and more, by saying the following, there is something breathtakingly condescending as well as inhumane about the sacrificing of anyone, especially children, on the altar of diversity and the virtue of preserving a variety of religious traditions." End quote. First, let me say Richard's case for defending children by condemning adults who he says are sacrificing children on the altar of diversity in order to preserve a variety of religious traditions is to me so hypocritical, especially when you consider the fact that Richard is pro-sacrifice of the unborn, meaning he's pro-abortion. Roughly 121 million unintended pregnancies occur each year worldwide. Of these unintended pregnancies, approximately 44% of them end in abortion. So that's around 53 million. This translates, as I said, to the slaughter of 53 million unborn babies annually, the majority being aborted just to satisfy the God of convenience. So I would say to Richard that teaching little children about Jesus Christ and his gospel of love versus promoting the ideology that says babies are just a part of the animal kingdom that is overpopulating and so the slaughter and quick disposal of millions of unborn babies is somehow virtuous and justified it is outside of the bounds of acceptable behavior in my opinion. One teaches the virtue of the love for life, and the other the ideology promoting the tragic taking of life from tiny, unborn baby human beings. By now you have come to realize that I'm definitely pro-life, but I grant others their own opinion and belief regarding this most serious, polarizing issue. Prior to making the statement where Richard criticizes parents teaching children their religious beliefs early on in their child's youth, Richard shared several religious traditions, beginning with that of the Inca nation. He gives the example of a young Inca girl whose 500-year-old remains were found in the mountains of Peru in 1995. The anthropologist who discovered her, John or excuse me, Johann Reinhard wrote that she had been the victim of a ritual sacrifice. Richard says, he said this, the decent, excuse me, the decent liberal reader may feel a twinge of unease, immoral by our standards, certainly, and stupid, but what about Inca standards, he says? Surely to the Incas, the sacrifice was a moral act and far from stupid, sanctioned by all that they held sacred. Who are we to use a word like murder, judging Inca priests by our own standards rather than theirs. I hope Richard is being a bit cynical here and facetious. Our own standards? Really? Perhaps this girl from her birth was taught the Inca ways and so was uh, rhetoric, excuse me, rapturously happy with her fate. Or perhaps, as seems far more likely, she screamed in terror." End quote. Nicholas Humphrey, an anthropologist colleague of Richard's, did a documentary on this young ice maiden. 
His point, which Richard points out for this subtitle, is that regardless of whether she was a willing victim or not, there is a strong reason to suppose that she would have um, not have been willing if she had been in full possession of the facts. In other words, when informed, this young woman it is assumed, would have probably made a different choice. Or if being forced to submit this to this atrocity, maybe she would have tried her very best to escape from her captors. Viewers of Humphrey's documentary on this young girl were invited to marvel at the spiritual commitment of the Inca priest and to share with the girl on her last journey her pride and excitement of having been selected for the signal honor of being sacrificed. Richard goes on to say that the message of Humphrey's television program was in effect that the practice of human sacrifice was in its own way a glorious cultural invention, another jewel in the crown of multiculturalism, in other words, diverse culturalism. If you like, with its religious bent, it promoted the idea that the Inca priests cannot be blamed for their ignorance, and it could perhaps be thought harsh to judge them stupid and puffed up, end quote. Humphreys then gets to the point of his documentary, which was, quote, but they can be blamed for foistering their own beliefs on a child too young to decide whether to worship the sun or not, end quote. Richard then gives a few more examples of ethnic religious habits and how they justly cru they justify cruelties in their name. He says it crops up again and again. It is the source, Richard says, of squirming internal conflict in the minds of nice liberal people who, on the one hand, cannot bear suffering and cruelty, but on the other have been trained by postmodernists and relativists to respect other cultures no less than their own, end quote. In addition to human sacrifice, Richard briefly reviews female genital mutilation, Hades, Hasidia, I can't say it, Hasidim, gypsies, and the Amish right to bring up their own children in their own way, as examples of how society has an excitement for maintaining cultural diversity and their cultural traditions. Isn't this just freedom of religion, allowing all men the privilege to worship as they may? As I read what Richard describes here as liberals' excitement for maintaining cultural diversity, I couldn't help but think about their full-throated support of the LGBTQIA and plus community, as well as the gender-neutral community who are pushing a total rewrite of the definition of male and female, as an example it being, what is a woman? It is my opinion that maintaining this so-called cultural diversity will ultimately be the ruin of our American society as we know it due to subjective moral standards replacing the objective moral standard given to mankind by God himself, our Heavenly Father, through his prophets and apostles and holy writ. Richard continues, It's a shame, maybe, when individuals have to be sacrificed to maintain such diversity. But there it is. It's the price we pay as a society. Except I would feel bound to remind you, we do not pay it. They do. End quote. Once again, this is an example of the old adage, remember, remember, if you pick up one end of the stick, you automatically pick up the other end of the stick, so you better know what the other end of the stick is, for it may be the opposite of what you wanted when you picked up the stick, end quote. Richard finishes this subtitle by saying to the adults that do the sacrificing of the children, once again, I think Richard has been sarcastic here, I sure hope he is, Quote, of course you must be allowed to trap your children with you in your 17th century time warp. Otherwise, something irretrievable would be lost to us, a part of the wonderful diversity of human culture. A small part of me can see something in this, but the larger part is made to feel very queasy indeed. End quote. My response to Richard's point he just gave is to simply remind you what Jesus himself said on this subject. The Savior spoke seriously of abuse when he said in Matthew 18 verses 2 through 7, And Jesus called a little child unto him, and set him in the midst of him, and said, Verily I say unto you, except ye be converted, and become as little children, become as little children, ye shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. Whosoever therefore shall humble himself as this little child, the same is greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And whoso shall receive one such little child in my name, receiveth me. But whoso shall offend, in other words, abuse or cause to stumble, one of these little ones which believe in me, it were better for him that a millstone were hanged around his neck, and that he were drowned in the depth of the sea. Woe unto the world because of offense, because of abuse, 
for it must needs be that offenses come. But woe to that man by whom the offense or abuse cometh. Mark 9.42 says, And whosoever shall offend one of these little ones that believe in me, it is better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck, and he were cast into the sea. Luke 17 repeats it again in verse 2. It were better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck, and he cast into the sea, than that he should offend one of these little ones. He's repeated in three different uh, records there. It must be serious. Abuse of children must be serious. Now, abuse is the mistreatment or neglect of others, such as a child or spouse, the elderly or the disabled, in a way that causes physical, emotional, or sexual harm. Verbal abuse being just one more form of abuse. The Church of Jesus Christ, the Latter-day Saints position, is that abuse cannot be tolerated in any of its forms. While some types of abuse may cause physical harm, all forms of abuse affect the mind and spirit. This kind of abuse often destroys faith and can cause confusion, doubt, mistrust, guilt, and fear in the victim, all of which can cause the child or adult to stumble and lose their faith in their Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Isn't this exactly how the woman in Richard's example described their stories of abuse? Let me also share another thought on the issue of infant baptism that Richard brought up earlier in this last video and that I expressed my perspective on as it relates to this topic of abuse. To Latter-day Saints, age 8, as I said, is when we become accountable for our behavior, knowing right from wrong, and are able to comprehend the principles of repentance in its simplicity. It is interesting to note that research indicates that, that from early history, the approximate age of 7 was commonly accepted as the age of responsibility and accountability. Under Roman law, for example, a child under the age of 7 was not considered to have developed sufficient discretion, discretion excuse me, or judgment to be responsible for his or her actions. The Roman law and most of Roman's paternal customs were undoubtedly influenced by Greek and Spartan paternal customs. Under Roman law, minors were divided into three classes. First, infants. Second, impubes, those prior to puberty. And three, upbearers, those after puberty. Infants were those under the age of seven, and impubes were those from age seven to pu puberty. Under the law, all those who had not reached puberty were subject to guardianship laws. Infants and insane persons were considered without intelligence and could not act for themselves. Their tutor or guardian acted for them. After age seven, each child was granted full legal rights. He was then considered to have intelligence, even though it was not mature judgment. He could perform legal acts of his own, unless his guardian demonstrated that an action was not in his best interest. The laws, as recorded by both Justinian and Gaius, demonstrate the evolution of Roman law into the great civilizing force that it became. And one constant was the attitude towards children in the age of accountability. Roman and Greek laws regarding infants affected the laws of most, if not all, countries that eventually came under Roman influence. This involved most of the countries of Europe. More than 2,000 years after the early Greeks and Romans, the Lord revealed the age 8 and not 7 or 9 was the proper age of accountability. End quote. I bring up this little tidbit of information from the age of the Roman Empire to make the point that, like Richard and Humphrey, I too recognize that young children do in fact need protection from the outrageous and dangerous societal traditions that push its own beliefs on their children who are far too young to decide for themselves what they want and don't want to believe, like these examples that Richard described. An example from our day is trans adults going into our grade schools and dancing provocatively in front of them. It is my belief that they are grooming little children who are innocent and vulnerable and therefore is an abomination in the sight of God when they do that. I mentioned that these supposed adults are, in my opinion, grooming little children by indoctrinating them in the ideology of gender transitioning. Transsexual dancing at grade schools and libraries by these individuals as well as the parents themselves normalizing this grooming has led to an explosion of children as young as 10 to 12 years old experiencing gender dysphoria, which of course has led to an explosion of children seeking puberty blockers and transition surgeries. I've included this in my book in order to make the point that all of us must protect our youth from such debauchery. That said, I do not feel it is fair to lump every religion into Richard's pot of religious extremism and their extreme practices. As you have seen, my perspective and arguments regarding these religious questions have been to simply provide you with the doctrine of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints regarding these topics. And that's because it is the only religion 
that can unabashedly claim that it has never, nor does it now teach such extreme apostate doctrines as infant baptism, human sacrifice, hedonism, or anything like unto it. Nor does it sacrifice its little ones on the altar of diversity or convenience in order to preserve its cultural diversity and religious traditions like Richard has accused all religions of doing. The Lord revealed to the prophet Joseph Smith that children, when eight years old, have developed sufficient discretion or judgment to be responsible and accountable for their own actions. That said, all of us still need to do all we can to protect our children from any extremist view, including, but not limited to, abuse of any kind. Now, I am very much aware, as a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, that Latter-day Saints are accused by some folks like Richard and the pack of barking dogs he runs with to be abusers of our little ones because we teach them the basic doctrines of faith in Heavenly Father and in His Son, Jesus Christ. We teach them the commandments, the principles of repentance, and other basic doctrines from the time they're just three years old. We teach them during what's called primary, so that by the time they reach the age of eight and accountability, they're ready to make and keep the covenants they will make at the time of their baptism with their Heavenly Father. There are other unrelated accusations that our critics use to justify calling the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints and our church as extremist, immoral, and occult, but I will only address two of the more notable and controversial ones. Because some of its leaders, but not all, as well as some of the members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, but not all, once practiced the principle of plural marriage over 130 years ago when it stopped, which practice has long since been set aside by the church leaders in compliance with the laws of the land. And because there are still LDS fundamentalists who are not members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints who practice what many call perverse, one such group is Warren Jeffs and his followers, followers, we as members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints are still considered extremist, immoral cultists. In addition to our limited past practice of polygamy, the Latter-day Saints are also accused of being racist as well, because the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints once had restrictions on its African-American members, keeping them from being ordained to the priesthood and receiving their temple ordinances, including married ceilings. This restriction ended in 1978, when the prophet and president of the church at that time, President Spencer W. Kimball, he served from December 30th, 1973 to November 5th of 1985, he received a revelation that said every worthy male member of the church could now be ordained to the priesthood no matter their skin color. Having had this restriction in the first place, however, some outsiders view our past religious practices as being racist, and by default, all members of the LDS church are viewed as racist today. You can go into a deeper dive regarding these two practices and their history, as well as other controversial topics, by searching for gospel topics essays at churchofjesuschrist.org, where you'll find a more comprehensive review of the history of both of these practices, as well as review the church's official position on each of these practices as they stand today. That said, going back to what Richard said about children being taught religion when they're just little children, I do agree with Richard when he says that little children should have been protected from their extremist authority figures, and they weren't. The resulting tra um, tra travesties stir an intense sense of righteous indignation in me, as I'm sure it does in you. I know what it absolutely stirs righteous indignation in the Father of all mankind, our Heavenly Father. I testify, God will not be mocked. His eternal judgment will be the abuser's wages for their heinous sins, which is death and separation from His presence. In Romans 6.23, we read, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Uh, it's at the end of this little subtitle, but I have to share a few thoughts on that. You know, uh, Mr. Walsh did a video called, uh, a long hour type video called, What is a Woman? And on that, you see so much diverse, subjective opinions and ordinary, loving, beautiful young women, old women, middle-aged women were asked and Many of them couldn't and or, or wouldn't even begin to try to define women because of this um, gender uh, dysphoria um, ideology that's springing forth, saying that there's unlimited 
LGBTQIA23++++++++ all sorts of gender identities what they feel like being even to the point where people are thinking they're a cat and that's okay but there's laws being made against those who will not recognize the pronouns and the pronouns are all over the map the they he she it was did I mean there's just unbelievable things going on in our society and the construction or construct of these ideology genders is creating quite the uproar I understand they're wanting to be identified. I understand that many have this dysphoria, this state of mind that screens them then that they're not um, either male or female. They're not comfortable in their body. They're, they were born as a woman in a man's body or they're born in a man's body, but they're a woman. I'm just saying that it's an interesting thing that we're seeing unfold, but it is speeding up so fast. It's, it's laws are being made, people are being fired, companies are being canceled. So many things can be because of just a small slice of folks who want to be recognized the way they want to recognize, and it's their, quote, truth. And if you don't accept my truth, we're going to punish you. We're going to uh, get you fired. We're going to get you arrested. We're going to bear false witness. I mean, it's just unbelievable. A woman is someone who is born with the right chromosomes for a, being a woman, and the man is the right chromosomes for the man, and there's two genders. Now somebody's hijacked the word gender and is redefining it and they're saying it has nothing to do with the, the two biological sexes. You know, I don't know what the purpose of that is, but somehow what I see, see the purpose of that is for them to um, create a situation where they are in control of the laws, they are in control of what is said and done, and many things behind the scenes as I see it is an ideology that is working behind the scenes to take out our little children, even younger than eight, where the accountability is, and taken down in homes and in a society that they don't even have the chance to exercise their own faith and their own free will and their own agency to choose Christ and his plan of happiness or Satan and his plan of destruction and death. And to, to take that agency away, God's going to react like he did in ancient times past when the apostasy got so bad and the sin and lasciviousness got so bad that the, they were teaching little ones and they were sacrificing and burning in, in boiling or burning arms and hands and in the bellies of false gods offering sacrifices, the drums beat. That kind of attitude or ideology is just an animal that's disposable like a dog or a cat that's stored away in a cage. Little ones are children of God that are yet to come wanting to have their chance to gain a body to exercise faith and gain and become like their Savior through following his gospel plan. Those decisions are being made when they're three and four years old and being um, brainwashed of an ideology that is wrong. Satan is having a real heyday in our time. And so I'll just simply say that this um, uh, society in which we live and what we're dealing with here is getting quite intense. And the middle ground, the middle ground of these two ideologies is being removed. There is no middle ground. There is no um, straddling of the fence. You either believe God's word or you believe man's word. And if you don't believe man's word, it's getting such that the wickedness is coming to where they're going to cancel you. They're going to fire you. They're going to beat you up. And in time, I predict, in time, there's going to be such persecution to Christians and Latter-day Saints, especially in that, that there will be tremendous persecution and risk of death. And it's going to be wild in this land of the free, supposedly a land of the free called America. It's going to be an America that I didn't get raised up in. It's an America I won't recognize because those rights and privileges of agency is going to be removed, everything in between. And you either stand for God or you stand for Satan, the Antichrist dogma. And we're seeing that being removed. Prophets of old prophesied. Nephi spoke of it. He saw the two churches. He saw the two religions, which are really two ideologies. Man's word, God's word. And the in-between's gone. And we're facing it. We better get ready. We better get ready and get our faith firmly planted on solid rock so we can withstand the storm and the winds and the darts of Satan because they're coming. They're that, that, coming at us now, but it's going to get worse. Anyhow, I'm just rambling on, so I'm going to close this off, and I hope you share your thoughts of what you see and what you feel and what stirred in your mind as you listen to this video. 
And any questions you have of me, type them in. Please subscribe so that it can get to more folks. This algorithm notices that, and then they start showing it to other places, other channels, other situations, and that's, that's, that would be pleasing, and I hope you see it the same. But until next time, I want to wish you continued success. Goodbye.